In the industrial sector, the Luxembourg steel industry continues to occupy the first place in the country, even after the industrial reforms which have taken place since the 1960s. History Early development Iron was already worked and processed by the Celts in the region of modern-day Luxembourg. Archaeological remains of this have been found on the Glaked between Esh Alzet and Rummelange. In the Genozebush near Pepinga, in 2003–2005 the remains of a smelting plant from the 13th or 14th century were found and excavated. In the pre-industrial period 17th–18th centuries, there were a number of furnaces throughout the country, located near rivers for water power or forests where charcoal was produced. Boners. Bean ore. Was used. The furnaces only employed a small number of permanent, specialized workers, estimated at about 700 in the late 18th century. This early industry involved another 8,000 to 10,000 workers on a seasonal basis, road workers, carriers, lumberjacks, colliers. These were generally farmers temporarily freed up from agricultural work, and earning some extra money. Luxembourgish steel industry generally produced iron bars, wrought iron and cast iron. Due to the weak domestic market, most of this was exported to workshops in Liege, which used the iron in their manufactured products which were exported from Dutch ports. Topic: 19th century. In 1841-1842, there were 11 blast furnaces in Luxembourg, which all used wood and whose total annual production amounted to 7,300 tons. The blast furnaces were in the following villages. In the mid-19th century, Luxembourg's steel industry changed radically. In 1842, Luxembourg joined the Zollverein, the German Customs Union, gaining access to a large market in the east. The treaty to join the Zollverein was regularly renewed over the next 60 years, and facilitated the country's industrial development. Profiting from the economic dynamism of its German neighbours, Luxembourg started exporting its iron ore to the Saar and Ruhr areas, but also to Belgian forges. A deposit of Manette, a low-quality Luxembourgish iron ore, had been discovered in the south of the country in 1842. In addition to the opening of the German market, the expansion of the railway network from 1855 to 1875 was another important factor, particularly the construction of the Luxembourg-Thienville railway line, with connections from there to the European industrial regions. As a consequence, it became profitable to use coke, which had an energy value five times as high as that of charcoal. This meant that the furnace owners were more and more interested in using Manette. From 1854 to 1869, there were 64 requests for a concession to mine Manette, mostly from Belgian and Prussian companies. About two-thirds of the mined Manette was exported to the Prussian Rhineland and to Belgium. From the 1870s, the influx of German capital, the exploitation of the mines of the esch alzett area in the south of the country, the use of the Thomas Gilchrist process in steel making after 1879, and a high level of immigration—Germans after 1870, Italians after 1890—contributed to make Luxembourg's steel industry one of the most important in Europe. Five large steel companies were founded from 1870 to 1890. Société des Hauts Fourneaux Luxembourgeois 1870. Société des Hauts Fourneaux de Rodange 1872. Société des Hauts Fourneaux de Hollerich 1877. Société des Hauts Fourneaux de Rumelange 1880. Société des Hauts Fourneaux et Forges de Dudelange 1882. Under a law passed in 1870, the state became the owner of all Manette reserves down to a certain depth. In 1880, another law was passed, which tied new concessions to mine Manette under the condition that it had to be processed in Luxembourg. This enabled certain Luxembourg families to play a key role in the furnaces. 
Topic steel industry families The brothers Charles, Norbert and Auguste Metz founded the «Society en Commandite Auguste Metz and CIE» in 1838, with the help of Belgian investments holding group «Société d'Industrie Luxembourgeoise». They rented the foundry of Berberg from Jean-Nicolas Collet and in 1845 built the Ike foundry. In 1847 they bought their investors' shares, and from then on ran the company Metz and CIE as a family business. In 1865, the Metz brothers opened a modern steel mill in Dommeldange, with four blast furnaces, which processed coke and manette. In 1870, Norbert Metz associated his company with the SA des Mines du Luxembourg et des Forges de Saarbrück, which was run by Victor Tesch. In 1871 they received permission to open a foundry in esch sur alzette which was later renamed Arbed Schifflange. This steel mill first produced cast iron, which was processed in Burbach, at Burbach Foundry. At the same time the Brasseur Foundry later Arbed Terres Rouges was founded in Esch, by the brothers Dominique Alexis and Pierre Brasseur. The following year, the Steinfurt foundry owners Charles and Jules Collet set up a foundry in Rodange, with other investors. The same year, the S.A. Goner, Munier et Helsen built blast furnaces in Rummelange. In the 1880s, there was a further change, the Metz brothers acquired the rights to the process invented in 1879 by Sidney Thomas and Percy Gilchrist, allowing cast iron to be made into steel. They first used this process in Ike, but soon after opened a new foundry in Dudelange, which used the new procedure exclusively. To run this plant, they partnered up with Victor Tesch and the Count de Bertier, who owned a large amount of land in Dudelange, and founded the Société Anonyme des Hort Fourneaux et Forges de Dudelange. Topic turn of the century, German influence and vertical integration from the late 19th century to World War I, the Luxembourg steel industry depended entirely on Germany, 90% of the coke used in Luxembourg was imported from the Ruhr, and up to 70% of its produce was sold to Germany. The machinery and technology came from Germany, as did the skilled personnel and the engineers. The decision-making centre was in the Ruhr, whereas Luxembourg was a kind of periphery, where raw materials and semi-finished goods were made, to be processed in the Ruhr. After the German annexation of Lorraine in 1871, Luxembourgish steel products were subject to intense competition. Germany's suppression of customs rights in 1873 and overproduction provoked an economic downturn amplified by the arrival of British cast iron. The re-establishment of customs rights in 1879 put an end to this crisis. From then onwards, cartels were formed with a view to regulating the steel market. In 1879, a Lorraine-Luxembourgish iron cartel was formed, and in 1889 a steel cartel, the lotharingisch luxemburgische Stahlwerksverband. Around the turn of the century, a greater level of vertical integration came about in Luxembourg. The exploitation of manette, iron extraction, steel production and the process of rolling the steel were organized close to each other. The companies banded together in bigger and bigger conglomerates. In 1911, the Metz and Tesch families amalgamated their companies to form ARBED, the SA des Assieries Reunies de Burbach Eich Dudelange. The Gelsenkirchener Berkwerks AG, the second largest German heavy industry group after Krupp, bought the Brasser foundry renamed Rotherd and its mines, and founded the Adolf Emil Hutter from 1909 to 1913 in esch The deutsch luxemburgisch Bergwerks und Hutten AG bought and modernized the Societe Anonyme des Hort Fourneaux de Diffidange, which had been founded in 1896 by Paul Wirth and Baron Alexandre de Gerlacher. It did the same with the foundry at Rummelange. The Belgian S.A. Dugri Marahay took over the Rodange foundry in 1905, and added a steelworks and rolling mill. The cable producer Felton and Guillaume, a subsidiary of the German AEG, took over the Steinfurt foundry in 1912. The production statistics make it clear how much the Luxembourg steel industry had changed within only 35 years. The volume of manette mined increased tenfold from 700,000 tons in 1868 to 7 million tons in 1913. The volume of cast iron produced increased from 100,000 tons to 2, 5 million, and steel production, started only in 1886, reached 1, 5 million tons in 1913. 
The number of blast furnaces increased from 14 in 1871 to 47 in 1913. Just before World War I, Luxembourg was the sixth largest cast iron producer worldwide, and the eighth largest producer of steel. Topic World War I and interwar period During World War I, industrial production continued in Luxembourg, now under German occupation. The social crisis brought about by the war caused the workers in the metallurgy industry to found trade unions. The politically neutral Luxemburger Berg und Hutenarbeiterverband was founded on 1 September 1916, and the socialist Metallarbeiterverband was created on 3 September. Yet the big break for the industry came later. As a consequence of the German defeat, Luxembourg had to withdraw from the Zollverein in 1919. The steel industry, amongst others, advocated a trade alliance with the French, but it was not to be. Instead, after tough negotiations, Luxembourg found a new economic and trade partner in Belgium, with whom it formed the Belgium-Luxembourg Economic Union in 1921. The post-war return of Lorraine, hitherto part of Germany, to France meant that the vast Lorraine-Luxembourg Saar industrial complex was broken up. The break with Germany meant that the Luxembourg steel industry not only had to reorient itself economically, but also had to restructure itself. The challenge was twofold, firstly, to secure both pre- and post-production markets that is, on the one hand, the supply of raw materials, manette and coke, and on the other, a demand for the finished products, from nails to grey beams, secondly, to take the place of the German firms, which had had to withdraw. In 1919, the German companies in Luxembourg were sold, a Franco-Belgo-Luxembourg consortium, the Société Métallurgique des Terres Rouges, with Schneider Crusot, ARBED and the Bank de Brussels as the main investors, bought the sites of the Gelsenkirchener Bergwerks AG including the foundries Rotherd and the Adolf Emil Hutter in Esch, ARBED, together with Terres Rouges, took over coal mines around Cologne, and in Belgium and the Netherlands in 1920. It also purchased concessions and land in Lorraine. In downstream production, it took over the Cologne, Felton and Guillaume 1919 and the Clautery et Trevelerie de Flanders 1921. A Franco-Belgian consortium, Hadir Hort Forno et Assyries de Diffidange, saint Ingbert, Rummelange, was founded by the Société Générale de Belgium and the Société Lorraine des Asias de Rombes and took over the sites of the Deutsch Luxemburgish Bergwerks und Hutten AG, which included the foundries of Diffidange and Rummelange, and the mines of Otungi. The foundry of Steinfurt went from Felton and Gillom to Athos Gravegni. They also took shares in various coal and ore mines. Schneider took over the German parts of Augri Marahe, including the foundry of Rodange, via a subsidiary. The German market had collapsed, the Belgian market was saturated by Belgian production, the French market was closed off due to customs. This meant that the Luxembourg foundry owners had to find new markets elsewhere in Europe, in America, and Asia. They quickly founded trading posts, to export their products worldwide. In 1920, ARBED founded Colometer Comptoir Luxembourgeois de Métallurgie, later renamed Trade Arbd, and HADIR followed suit in 1923, by joining SOGECO Société Générale pour le Commerce de Produits Industriels. Colometer had branches in Brazil, Argentina, India and Japan. New markets for the steel industry were found in Britain, Italy, Austria and the Netherlands. In 1923-1925, sold 72-75% of its production in Europe, Belgium 20% and Germany 11% were the major clients. America and Asia each absorbed about 12%. Unlike the situation under the Zollverein, the external markets had become highly volatile. The German market, essential to Luxembourg's economy, had been kept open until 1925 by provisional measures of the Treaty of Versailles. However, this concession was effectively cancelled out by the massive inflation in Germany in 1922-1923. The Luxembourg steel industry managed to transform itself in a short period of time from a supplier of German steel companies into an independent producer of diverse finished goods, which were competitive on the world market. In summary, one can say that the basis for Luxembourg steel production, as it was to remain until the 1970s, was laid at the end of World War I. The steel war between France and Germany, of which the occupation of the Ruhr area was a part, was highly damaging to Luxembourg. The head of ARBED, Emile Mayrisch, sought to bring about a Franco-German rapprochement. 
His knowledge of both countries and their languages, and many contacts in the business world, allowed him to play the role of an honest broker. In September 1926 he managed to reach acceptance of the International Steel Pact. This functioned as a cartel, and put an end to the steel war. Five large steel producers limited their production through a quota system, 40,5% for Germany, 31,9% for France, 12,6% for Belgium, 6,6% 6, for the Saar region, 8,5% for Luxembourg. In 1926, Luxembourg again reached its 1913 level of production 2,560,000 tons of cast iron, and surpassed it in 1929 with 2,906,000 tons. The following years of the interwar period, in contrast to the early boom years, were characterized by a level of stagnation, and several crises. The foundry of Rummelange closed down in 1927, as did that of Steinfurt in 1931. There were further technological breakthroughs, but none as revolutionary as the Thomas Gilchrist process. Production in the 1930s was subject to large fluctuations. Luxembourg did not escape the consequences of the Great Depression, which hit the country with some delay. Production stood at 2,512,000 tons in 1937 and 1,551,000 tons in 1938. There had traditionally been a high number of foreigners working in the steel industry in Luxembourg, making up 60% of the workforce in 1913. This proportion had declined in World War I, however, it then increased from a level of 25% in 1922 to 40% in 1930. The 1920s, then, showed that although World War I constituted a break, heavy industry was still dependent on foreign labor. During the economic crisis after 1929, employers tended to lay off foreign workers first, meaning that by 1939 their proportion of the steel workforce had sunk to 20%. With the sale of German companies after World War I, the proportion of Luxembourgish managers in the steel industry also increased. ARBED traditionally favoured them, while Hadir preferred to have Frenchmen in positions of management. <inaudible> <inaudible> World War II After Luxembourg had been invaded in May 1940 and occupied by German troops, a German civil administration headed by Gauleiter Gustav Simon was established in July 1940. It had two main goals, to turn the Luxembourgers' minds towards Deutschtum, and to bring the steel industry under German control. Immediately after the occupation, two high-level functionaries were sent to the county. These were Otto Steinbrink, Commissioner General for the Belgo-Luxembourg Iron Producing Industry, and Paul Rabi, Commissioner General for Iron Ore Exploitation and Distribution for Lorraine and Luxembourg. In June 1940, Steinbrink called together the Luxembourg heads of industry, to make them pledge to cooperate with the Germans. Anyone refusing to do so would have to resign. The representatives of ARBED and the Rodange Foundry agreed to the conditions, while those of Hadir refused. Thereupon, on 15 June the Hadir Foundries were incorporated into a new body, the Differdinger Stahlwerk AG. The Rodange Foundry, owned by Augry Marahe, was allowed to continue its existence, it received a German trustee as its head, and was renamed the Eisenhutten Werk Rodingen. Several German steel companies, including the Reichswerk Hermann Göring, were eager to take over ARBED. Gustav Simon would not allow this, he recognized the key role that ARBED played in Luxembourg, and was reluctant to lose control over it. ARBED's management was not changed, Alois Amaya remained managing director, due to fears that this would affect its productivity. However, a delegate was sent from Germany to oversee Mayer's work. The share ownership of ARBED, which had mostly belonged to the Société Générale de Belgium, was much changed, and the executive board was to include nine Germans and six Luxembourgers, compared to the pre war 15 Luxembourgers and two Belgians. It was, however, intended from the outset that when Germany had won the war, ARBED and the Rodange foundry would also pass into German ownership. <laughs> Wartime production 
Concerning the production levels in wartime, there are two periods to be distinguished. From August 1940 to March 1942, production was lower than before the war, due to the collapse of the French export market, the need to retool towards the German market, and the lack of raw materials. In August 1940, there were 14,000 unemployed. But from April 1942 until the liberation, the war industry's demands grew and grew. There were now not enough workers to meet demand. Another reason was that from September 1942, 1,200 foundry workers were forcibly conscripted into the Wehrmacht. Thus, from autumn 1942 onwards, hundreds of so-called Ostarbeiter were taken from the occupied territories of Eastern Europe to Luxembourg and forced to work in the foundries and mines. They were not qualified to work in the foundries, and therefore production levels never reached those of the interwar period. Other prisoners were also forced to work in the foundries, at Arbd Schifflange, prisoners from the external camp of the Natzfeiler Struthoff concentration camp at Auden le Tiche were used. <laughs> European integration and post-war boom Due to the national importance of each country's steel sector, there was a grave risk of overproduction. For this reason, it was necessary to create a supranational body capable of coordinating European steel production. The French Foreign Minister, Robert Schumann, proposed the creation of a European coal and steel community in 1950. Soon, Germany, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg agreed to the Schumann Plan. For Luxembourg, the stakes were high, as steel was vital to its economy. The Schumann Plan would allow it to export its products to Germany and France, and grant it free access to the raw materials it required. At the same time, there was some nervousness at transferring sovereign rights to a supranational institution, it would mean transferring control over a central part of the national economy to a common body. Trade union leaders feared the move would mean lower pay for Luxembourgish workers, while managers feared that subsidies to Belgian coal producers would mean an imbalance in prices between Belgium and Luxembourg. The Benelux countries each received one seat in the high authority, and Luxembourg was allocated four out of 78 seats in the Common Assembly. The period from World War II to 1974, known as the Trente Gloriouses, was characterized by stable growth. In 1958, 25,700 people were employed in the Luxembourg steel industry, rising to 27,200 in 1974. Steel production rose from 3 million tons in 1951, to 4 million in 1960, to 6, 4 million in 1974. Between 1946 and 1967, 32 billion francs were invested in the factories. In Belval, the blast furnaces A 1965 and B 1970 started production. A new process, the so-called LDAC process, allowed steel quality to be improved. ARBED managed to reinforce its position, and in 1967 it took over Hadir, thereby becoming a monopoly producer in Luxembourg steel production and processing. Around the same time, it became the majority owner of the Sidmar factory in Ghent, one of the most modern steelworks in Europe, with direct access to the sea. <laughs> Steel crisis and reorientation In 1974 the world steel market collapsed due to overproduction. The reasons for this were the oil crisis of 1973, which increased energy prices and caused demand to decrease, competition from Asia, which was growing bigger and bigger, and European steel companies owned by the state, which to some extent brought their products to market at dumping prices. In one year, from 1974 to 1975, sales from Luxembourg fell from 6, 4 million tons to 4, 6 million tons. It soon became clear that this was not a short-term incident, but a structural steel crisis. ARBED faced the challenge of modernizing itself as quickly as possible to become profitable again with declining sales and income. <laughs> Luxembourg's social model In 1975 a law was enacted that prevented layoffs for economic reasons. 
On 18 August 1975 a tripartite economic committee was created, that is, a committee involving representatives of employers, trade unions and the government. Its goal was to manage the disappearance of thousands of jobs in steel working as well as possible. In 1977, a division anti-cries, or DAC, was created, where those who had lost their jobs in steel working could do community work 2,700 people in 1977. Obligatory early retirement at 57 years was introduced for ARBED employees, as well as cash subsidies for those who left voluntarily. In March 1979, a tripartite agreement was reached, stipulating that ARBED would invest 23,2 billion francs by 1983 to modernize its factories. The unions accepted that worker numbers would be reduced to 16,500, and the Luxembourg government granted ARBED a loan of 3,2 billion francs, over 10 years. The production facilities that were not profitable and not worth modernizing, were closed. Additionally, synergy agreements were made with other steel producers, instead of everyone doing everything across the whole range of products, only the most profitable site for each would remain in existence. Thus, the Steckel Mill at Dudelange was closed. 1979 showed that these measures would not be enough, the steel crisis intensified, through increased inflation, which increased interest levels on loans, the second oil crisis, which caused energy and raw material prices to shoot up, and overproduction, which was still a factor in different steel-producing countries, despite the Davignon plan. ARBED had received relatively little government money at this point, compared to its competitors. From 1976 to 1982, it invested 25,8 billion francs, of which only 10% were from the state. The DAC cost 5,1 billion in the same period, of which the state covered 1,6 billion. In other areas, where people were simply made redundant, these costs did not exist. From 1975 to 1979, a ton of steel was supported with 13 francs in Luxembourg, 700 to 900 francs in France, 1,500 francs in the UK, and with 1,800 francs in Belgium. Thus, the tripartite agreement was changed in 1979, and on 8 April 1982 a law created the National Investment Contribution. Contribution nationale d'investissement, also called the «Solidarity Tax», which was levied by general taxation. <laughs> <laughs> Improving prospects In 1984, a law was enacted through which the state of Luxembourg became an investor in ARBED and took over all the shares of Sidmar. To finance this, the solidarity tax was raised from 5% to 10%. After further investments in ARBED, in 1986 the Luxembourg government was the largest investor with 43,9% of shares. However, the state only had 38% of voting rights. In the 1990s, prospects improved. The individual companies of the ARBED group were structured as autonomous units, which were each responsible for showing good results. In 1992, ARBED bought up the Maxhart Unterwellendorf, and through Sidmar, bought the majority of Klockner Stahl in Bremen. It increased its share of the capital of Belgo Minera to become the main investor. The Metallurgique et Minière de Rodange Athos, of which ARBED had owned 25% since 1978, passed completely into its ownership in 1994. In 1994, ARBED took the strategic decision to use only electric production. The time of the blast furnace, using ore and coke, was over. Over the next few years, all steelworks in Luxembourg were converted to use electric arc furnaces, in which scrap iron was melted using electricity. The last blast furnace in Luxembourg, HFB in Belval, was closed in July 1997. Topic: <laughs> Arcelor and Metal Steel. On 18 February 2002, ARB merged with the Spanish company Acerelia, of which it had owned 35% since 1997, and the French Usina. The new group, headquartered in Luxembourg, took the name Arcelor. It became the largest steel company in the world. 
Metal Steel announced a takeover bid for Arcelor in January 2006. After long discussions, on 25 June 2006 Arcelor agreed to merge with the Anglo-Dutch group Lakshmi Metal. The new group, formed from the two largest steel producers in the world, took the name ArcelorMetal. Its headquarters initially remained in the Avenue de la Liberté in Luxembourg. The first factory worldwide to receive the name ArcelorMetal, was ArcelorMetal Dudelange. The group made about 6% of the world's steel in 2016. See also Economy of Luxembourg Emile Mayrisch History of the steel industry 1850 History of the steel industry 1970 -present. Topic. Notes and references Topic. Bibliography Cranes, Jean Marie. 2010. Histoire du Luxembourg, 5th ed., Paris, Presses Universitaires de France. Crea, Emile. 1989. La Siderurgie au Luxembourg pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Les Cahiers Lorraines, 61 65. Labout, René, Puissant, Jean, Scutu, Dennis. 1998. UN siècle de histoire industrielle, 1873 1973. Belgium, Luxembourg, Pays Bas. Industrialisation et societies. SEDES. Schmidt, Lambert. 2006. Richesses d'un region, émoi d'un nation. Sur les traces de la siderurgie dans le bassin d'Essich. Nos Cahiers, three quarters, eleven to twenty six. Topic Further reading Trausch, Gilbert. Lab dans la Societe Luxembourgeoise. Abd Corporate Publications S.D. Hemmer, Carlo. L'économie du Grand Duche de Luxembourg, La Production Secondaire, L'Industrie Siderurgique. Luxembourg, Editions Joseph Beffert, 1953 External links Iron and Steel Industry. LU, the official portal of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Le Gouvernement du Grand Duche de Luxembourg, 28 April 2015. Retrieved 16 November 2016. Cassily, Simone, the 12th of March 2013. L'industrie sidérurgique luxembourgeoise depuis les années 60. Le Luxembourg 1960 to 2010 in French. STATEC, Institut National de la Statistique et des Etudes Économiques. Retrieved the 16th of November 2016.